The Committee on Homeland Security Subcommittee on Border and Maritime Security will come to order. <clears throat> the subcommittee is meeting today to examine the role of technology in the nation's border security efforts. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. Border security is a complicated endeavor because there's no one-size-fits-all solution. Thinking through what it will take to secure the border is primary responsibility of the three agencies represented by our witnesses today. Border Patrol is our operational force between the ports of entry. CBP's Office of Field Operations job is to facilitate legitimate trade and travel while keeping illicit drugs and people from entering our country at the ports, illegally at the ports of entry. Air and Marine is support, the supporting element, which provides air and maritime interdiction support and situational awareness for critical operations on the ground. All three of these critical border security components rely heavily on technology to accomplish their mission. Indeed, technology is a crucial force multiplier and part of a multi-layered approach of the right mix of infrastructure, personnel, and technology that we've used for at least 20 years now. Instead of focusing solely on the gadgets and the gizmos and the many repeated failures we've had in the procurement process at CBP, I think it's important to think strategically about the decision-making process, those who aim to exploit our border for illicit purposes. Disrupting that process by leveraging technology will help Customs and Border Protection better use the allocated funding to secure the border in the long term. So today, I want to take a hard look at the role that technology plays in helping to predict, deter, detect, and finally interdict the illicit activity so prevalent along the southwest border. Deterrence is the ideal goal of the nation's border security effort, yet is difficult to measure or accomplish. Discouraging bad actors from ever crossing the border is our best defense. If our security posture is robust, individuals may decide it's not worth the risk to smuggle a load of drugs across the Arizona desert or through a busy port of entry. Essentially, deterrence is predicted, predicated on two things. First, the perception that illegal smuggling across the border is a costly endeavor, and second, that the likelihood of success is low. But if we cannot successfully deter illegal behavior by communicating the message that the border is an inhospitable place to conduct illicit cross-border activity, then we have to shift to detection, surveillance, and interdiction. That is where the role of technology becomes indispensable because of the rugged and remote nature of many parts of the border. Terrain, the prevalence of roads and other infrastructure on both sides of the border, and CBP's security posture in any given area should inform the tools we use to detect, monitor, and surveil the border. On a consistent basis, these tools are critical for what is commonly referred to as situational awareness, or SA, uh, a basic requirement if the goal is to gain then operational control of the southern border. Cameras, night vision devices, motion sensors, radar, x-ray devices, and other surveillance equipment have become essential elements of our border security operations. These technologies have enhanced agent and officer safety, provided constant monitoring of difficult to access areas, and enhanced agent and officer ability to interdict the criminal activity. Aviation assets, such as unmanned aerial vehicles, equipped with advanced radar capabilities, have also refined our understanding of the significant threat that exists along the border and have helped to reposition and redeploy assets as flows and vulnerabilities shift. I understand that Border Patrol and CBP Air and Marine continue to pilot tactical UAVs that have the potential to revolutionize the way we conduct border security operations at the field agent level. I look forward to a progress update in light of the additional funds Congress has provided for this particular effort. A secure, a secure border is the outcome the American people demand, regardless of what st steps that we all take to get there. With this in mind, Congress has repeatedly asked one consequential question. What will it take to gain this situational awareness and operational control of the southwest border? Up until now, the answers we received have been limited or unsupported by a requirement process similar to that of the Defense Department. In short, they've been insufficient. At best, they've been some best guesses. Congress expects the Border Patrol, Office of Field Operations, and Air Marine to be able to quickly identify and justify the technological needs required to secure the border. So far, the Border Patrol and Air Marine operations have been involved in an effort called the Capability Gap Analysis Process, or CGAP. CGAP is a scenario-based exercise designed to ferret out tactical weaknesses in our border security defenses and hopefully inform the technological budget process. Putting more technology on the border will increase our chances of apprehending, apprehending dangerous individuals and interdicting lethal drugs like heroin and fentanyl uh, that cause so much death and pain for our fellow American citizens. Thanks for being here to discuss the many ways in which we can be using technology to secure our nation's border, and I look forward to the witness's testimony. The chair now recognizes the ranking member, the substitute ranking member, uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Korea, for an opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I'm pleased to join you for today's hearing examining U.S. Customs and Border Protection's efforts to enhance border security with the use of technology. 
Uh, ranking member Vela can't join us today uh, due to some other commitments, so I'm happy to step in in his uh, stead. Um, over the past several years, we've seen technology used to improve situational awareness, enhance security, and to improve legitimate commerce across our borders. While Secretary Kelly and many lawmakers in Congress talk about the value of technology to better secure our borders, we remain concerned that we are not utilizing technology to its fullest benefits. We know the new Trump administration has prioritized physical barriers over to technology to secure the border. President Trump ran for office with a promise to build a wall uh, to stop undocumented immigrants and to curb drug smuggling. Uh, while experts before this committee have told us that a border wall will not accomplish either one of these goals, um, earlier this month the Appropriations Committee approved $1.6 billion for the construction, I should say continued construction of that border wall. While we allocate billions in the border wall uh, that may not work, um, I'm hearing stories of many of our border agents not being able to talk to each other using their existing equipment. I've heard uh, some of these folks tell me that they can see each other two to 300 yards away, yet they can't use some of their walkie-talkies. And to me, th that is just a sad testament to the situation we have with reference to existing technology. With limited resources for technology on the border, it's important that Customs and Border get it right when it comes to pro procuring, testing, and deploying technology along the border. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security has for years attempted to deploy various kinds of technology to the borders with mixed results at best. Identifying, acquiring, and deploying the right mix of border security technology isn't easy, but we gotta get it right. A million here, a million there, translates to a billion here and a billion there, and those dollars we can only spend once. Those are very, very precious, taxpayer dollars. Uh, we know that the floor uh, border crossers and illicit traffic changes from day to day and our technology and our tactics need to evolve along with those changes. This is another reason, a primary reason why a border wall in my opinion is not a solution to our border security challenges. And remember, we have two borders and we have two oceans. Americans' borders are varied as well with different geography, terrain, and climate. Given DHS's poor track record and seemingly sh uh, unending shift uh, to physical barriers or technology, I remain concerned about our border security and technology deployment. I'd like to hear today uh, CBP justify why wholesale physical infrastructure plan would be more effective than deploying strategic technological assets along the border. And as Secretary Kelly has said here numerous times, the border, rather, we need a multi-layered defense system. I also hope to hear from our GAO witness today about their examination of CBP's metrics to measure the performance of border technologies and whether DHS's procurement and acquisition management processes are sound or still need to be improved. Also, in light of the massive acquisition management resources that would be needed and to be dedicated to constructing a physical wall, I'd like to know how CBP will manage existing technology contracts as it shifts to focus on personnel to man the new wall. Finally, I hope we can have a frank discussion with our witnesses about how CBP can best position its ongoing border security technology programs for success in this environment of scarce resources. I thank the witnesses for joining us here today, and I yield back my time, Madam Chair. Someone yields back. Other members of the committee are reminded that opening statements may be submitted for the record. We're pleased to be joined today by four distinguished witnesses to discuss this important topic. Mr. Todd Owen is the Executive Assistant Commissioner for the Office of Field Operations. Prior to becoming Executive Assistant Commissioner, Mr. Owen served in various roles within CBP's Office of Strategic Trade and most recently as a Director of Field Operations at CBP's Los Angeles Field Office. Mr. Scott Luck began his career with the Border Patrol in 1986 and currently serves as the Acting Deputy Chief of the U.S. Border Patrol. Prior to becoming Acting Deputy Chief, Mr. Luck was the Chief of Operations Division for the U.S. Border Patrol. Dennis J. Michelini 
serves as the acting executive director of operations for U.S. Customs and Border Protection's Air and Marine Operations Division. Mr. Michelini began his career with CBP in 1995, where he served as an agent and a pilot. Prior to becoming the acting executive of operations. He served as director of the Northern Region and director of air operations strategy. And Ms. Rebecca Gambler is director in the U.S. Government Accountability's Office, Homeland Security and Justice Team, where she leads GAO's work on border security, immigration, and the Department of Homeland Security's management and transformation. The witness's full written statement will appear in the record. The chair now recognizes Mr. Owen for five minutes to testify. Good morning. Chairwoman McSally, Ranking Member Vela, Mr. Correa, esteemed members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today alongside my colleagues from the U.S. Border Patrol and Air and Marine Operations to discuss the role of CBP's Office of Field Operations in detecting and interdicting illegal drugs and other dangerous materials at our ports of entry. Before my appointment as the Executive Assistant Commissioner of CBP's Office of Field Operations in February of 2015, I served in several relevant roles within CBP most recently as a Director of Field Operations for the Greater Los Angeles Area, and previously as the Executive Director over all of CBP's cargo security programs. I know firsthand how valuable technology is to CBP's ability to detect materials that potentially pose a threat to the United States. Used in conjunction with CBP's risk-based targeting capabilities and security partnerships, advanced detection technology at our ports of entry is an essential component in our mission to intercept illegal drugs and other dangerous materials before they cross our borders. Smugglers use a wide variety of tactics and techniques for concealing drugs and other contraband through the ports of entry. CBP officers regularly find drugs concealed on individuals, hidden inside vehicle seat cushions, gas tanks, dashboards, and tires, within packaged food, household goods, and hygiene products, in check luggage, and in construction materials transported on commercial trucks. This past weekend, CBP officers in Laredo discovered and seized 147 pounds of cocaine hidden in the gas tank of a commercial bus. While in Nogales, CBP officers intercepted three internal carriers of heroin and methamphetamine. All three U.S. citizen females were traveling together and had entered through the pedestrian lanes. And yesterday in Brownsville, CBP officers seized 118 pounds of methamphetamine concealed in tires of a passenger vehicle. These are but three real life examples of the threats that CBP officers address every day. To counter the full range of concealment techniques, CBP incorporates advanced technology to maintain a robust cargo, commercial conveyance, and vehicle inspection regimes at our ports of entry, including the use of non-intrusive inspection equipment or NII equipment, as well as radiation detection technologies. NII technologies deployed to our nation's land, sea, and air ports of entry include large-scale X-ray and gamma-ray imaging systems, as well as a variety of portable and handheld technologies. These technological systems enable CBP officers to examine cargo conveyances such as sea containers, commercial trucks, rail cars, and privately owned vehicles for the presence of contraband without physically opening or unloading them. NII equipment is a force multiplier, which allows CBP to work smarter and faster in detecting contraband while expediting legitimate trade and travel. Detection technology is cr a critical contributor toward enforcement actions at ports of entry. In 2016, large-scale NII systems were used to conduct more than 6.5 million examinations, resulting in more than 2,600 seizures and over 359,000 pounds of seized narcotics. In partnership with the DHS Domestic Nuclear Detection Office, CBP has also deployed nuclear and radiological detection equipment such as radiological detection portal monitors, radiation isotope identification devices, and personal radiation detectors nationwide. Using radiation portal monitors, CBP is able to scan 100% of mail and express consignment parcels, 100% of all trucks and personally owned vehicles arriving from Canada and Mexico, and nearly 100% of all arriving maritime containerized cargo for the presence of radiological or nuclear materials. In conjunction with CBP's many other initiatives, advancements in cargo, conveyance, and vehicle screening technology significantly increases CBP's ability to detect and interdict illegal drugs, radiological weapons, and other dangerous materials, and continues to be a cornerstone of CBP's multi-layered border security strategy. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Mr. Locke for five minutes to testify. OK, 
Can you make sure your microphone is on? Chairwoman McSally, Ranking Member Vela, Mr. Correa, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of the men and women of the U.S. Border Patrol to discuss our use of technology to secure the border. Our Border Patrol operations along the southwest border are continuously challenged by evolving tactics in transnational criminal organizations and individuals. The Border Patrol uses sophisticated technology, a critical element in our layered border strategy, to enhance our situational awareness and to detect changes in threat levels and criminal flows across the border. Thanks to the support of this subcommittee, CBP continues to, depo to deploy capable technology resources to increase our ability to detect illegal activity along the southwest border and our ability to more efficiently, effectively, and safely respond as appropriate to potential threats. With enhanced detection and surveillance capabilities, Border Patrol agents can improve their situational awareness remotely, direct our agents to the best interdiction location, and warn of any other additional danger otherwise unknown along the way. As a result, these investments increase the Border Patrol's visibility on the border, our operational capabilities, and the safety of our frontline law enforcement personnel. As many on this subcommittee know, the terrain along the border between the United States and Mexico is extremely diverse, consisting of deserts, mountains, and urban areas. Tailored to address an area's risk and environmental challenges, CBP deploys a combination of fixed, mobile, and relocatable technology assets with short, medium, and long-range persistent surveillance capabilities to maintain situational awareness of the varying border environments. For example, integrated fixed towers deployed along the border in Arizona provide a long-range persistent surveillance. These tower systems automatically detect and track items of interest and provide centralized operators with video and geospatial location of suspected items of interest for identification and appropriate action. Remote video surveillance systems, RVSS, are another fixed technology asset used by the U.S. Border Patrol to provide persistent surveillance in select areas along the southwest and northern borders. These systems, which use cameras, radio, and microwave transmitters to send video to a control room, enable the Border Patrol to remotely detect, identify, classify, and track targets effectively. Mobile technology, mounted on vehicles or carried by agents, is used in conjunction with fixed assets and provides the Border Patrol flexibility and agility to adapt to the changing border conditions and threats. Tactical aerostats and relocatable towers, acquired as part of the Department of Defense reuse program, have also proven to be a vital asset in increasing CBP situational awareness and our ability to detect, identify, and track illegal cross-border activity. Mobile surveillance technology systems enable Border Patrol agents to position the technology where it is needed at a specific moment, extend our observational capabilities, and increase the accuracy and speed of our response. In addition to the use of surveillance technology, collaboration and information sharing with our law enforcement par partners is a key component of building situational awareness and response capabilities along our southwest border. We work closely with our CBP partners, especially air and marine operations, as well as multiple DHS, federal, international, state, tribal, and local law enforcement agencies. Technology is critical to the Border Patrol's border security operations. A tailored blend of fixed, mobile, and portable surveillance systems that complement one another and work in conjunction with other elements of our operations, including intelligence, partnerships, and tactical infrastructure, increases the Border Patrol's effectiveness in addressing high-risk and seasonal or periodic traffic patterns and enables rapid response strategies to maximize limited manpower. Chairwoman McSally, Ranking Member Vela, Mr. Correa, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. In closing, I would like to thank the men and women of the United States Border Patrol for their hard work and dedication to duty, who unselfishly protect our nation 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Luck. Uh, I think I pronounced your name wrong, Mr. Michelini, not Michelini? Michelini. That's correct. Okay, so it's Michelini. Mm -hmm. Okay, Chair now recognizes Mr. Michelini for five minutes. Good morning, Chairwoman McSally, Ranking Member Vila, and Mr. Correa, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. It is an honor to appear before you today to discuss the technology used by CBP Air and Marine Operations 
AMO in securing our nation's borders. A critical component of CBP's border security mission, AMO secures the United States from transnational threats, including terrorism, weapons and drug smuggling, and other illicit activities throughout our four core competencies, interdiction, investigations, domain awareness, and contingencies and national taskings. Throughout my 22 years in law enforcement, first as a Border Patrol agent and then as an air interdiction pilot, I have personally witnessed a significant increase in the development and deployment of technology to aid in the security of our borders, the result of which has, without doubt, improved our efficiency and effectiveness in fulfilling our law enforcement mission. Throughout the use of coordinated and integrated surveillance capabilities, including aviation, marine, tethered aerostats, and integrated ground-based sensors, AMO detects, interdicts, and prevents the unlawful movement of people, illegal drugs, and other contraband toward or across the borders of the United States. Our technology assets provide multi-domain awareness for our partners across CBP and the Department of Homeland Security as well as critical aerial and maritime surveillance, interdiction, and operational assistance to our ground personnel. AMO's aerial surveillance capabilities are enhanced through recent investments and deployments of fixed-wing, rotary, and unmanned aircraft. These assets are equipped with a range of advanced sensor systems tailored to specific operational environments and provide critical detection interdiction capability. Sophisticated sensors and high endurance aerial capabilities greatly increase AMO's effectiveness in countering illicit cross-border activity. AMO operates the Air and Marine Operations Center, AMOC, which is a state-of-the-art law enforcement domain awareness center. AMOC uses advanced surveillance systems and intelligence databases to detect threats to homeland and coordinate their interdiction. AMO also combats airborne and maritime smuggling with an integrated long-range radar architecture comprised of ground-based radars and elevated radars deployed on tethered aerostats. Across our entire program, AMO contributed to more than 4,300 arrests, 55,000 apprehensions, and the interdiction of nearly 200,000 pounds of cocaine in fiscal year 16. AMO lends its capabilities to a variety of federal partners, including the U.S. Coast Guard and the United States Navy, by conducting counter-narcotic operations in the southeast coastal and source and transit zones. We are the leading provider of airborne detection and monitoring to the Joint Interagency Task Force South. We also provide direct assistance to partner nations with a shared interest in border security, most notably Mexico and Canada. Moving forward, we will continue to work with our CBP and other partners to enhance our detection, investigation, and interdiction capabilities to address emerging threats and to protect America's security interests along the nation's border in source and transit zones in our own customs waters and within the nation's interior. Chairwoman McSally, Ranking Member Vila, Mr. Correa, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Ms. Gambler for five minutes to testify. Good morning, Chairwoman McSally, Ranking Member Vela, Ranking Member Carrera, members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to testify at today's hearing to discuss GAO's work on DHS efforts to acquire and deploy various technologies along U.S. borders. DHS has employed a variety of assets in its efforts to secure the southwest border, including various land-based surveillance technologies. GAO has reported on DHS's management and oversight of these surveillance technologies under the former Secure Border Initiative and the department's more recent plans. My remarks today will summarize some of GAO's past reports as well as some preliminary observations from our ongoing work for this subcommittee on CBP's various surveillance technologies. More specifically, CBP has made progress in deploying technologies along the southwest border. This includes fixed and mobile surveillance systems, agent portable devices, and ground sensors, and these technologies have aided CBP's border security efforts. As of July 2017, CBP has completed deployment of selected technologies to areas in Arizona, Texas, and California. For example, CBP has reported deploying all planned remote video surveillance systems, or RVSS, and mobile surveillance capability systems, or MSCs, to Arizona. 
CBP has also reported uh, deploying 15 of 53 planned integrated fixed towers, or IFTs, to Arizona. And CBP has deployed all planned MSC systems to Texas and California. Although CBP has made this progress in technology deployments, we have also reported that CBP could do more to strengthen its management of technology programs and better assess the contributions of surveillance technologies to border security efforts. For example, CBP has previously experienced delays in some of its technology programs. We have also previously reviewed CBP's schedules and life cycle cost estimates for the IFT, RVSS, and MSC programs and we compared these schedules and estimates to best practices. Overall, the schedules and estimates for the programs reflected some, but not all, best practices. And we found that CBP could take better, further action to better ensure the reliability of its schedules and cost estimates by more fully applying those best practices. CBP has taken steps toward addressing our recommendations in these areas, such as providing us with updated schedules for some of the technology programs, which have showed notable improvements in quality. We are continuing to review CBP's schedules and estimates as part of our ongoing work for this subcommittee. Further, CBP has identified the mission benefits of surveillance technologies, such as improved situational awareness and agent safety. CBP has also begun requiring Border Patrol to record data within its database on whether or not an asset, such as a camera, assisted in an apprehension or seizure. These are positive steps toward helping CBP assess the contributions of its surveillance technologies to border security. However, CBP needs to develop and implement performance measures and analyze data it is now collecting to be able to fully assess the contributions of its technologies to border security. In closing, we are continuing to examine CBP's use of technologies for border security as part of our ongoing work. We will also continue to follow up on actions taken by CBP in response to our recommendations for improving management and measurement of the agency's land-based surveillance technologies. Uh, this concludes my oral statement, and I'm happy to answer any questions members have. Thank you, Ms. Gambler. Uh, now I recognize myself for five minutes for questions. Uh, Chief Luck and Director uh, Michelini, uh, air assets are, are a critical part of the technology uh, integrated to build situational awareness for both operational uh, level but also tactical level. Uh, and air has been critical in the Tucson sector, but uh, we've lost a, a bit of our air capability in that sector, and we understand that we're going to lose some more in the future here. And I understand there's... Uh, Increased activity in, in other sectors, uh, but still 50% of the marijuana comes to the Tucson sector. And especially in the hot summer, uh, we have a number of, of deaths in the desert, and the air assets are very critical to uh, getting to people uh, before, they, uh, before it's life-threatening. So uh, could you share uh, what the impact has been of um, decrease in air in the Tucson sector and uh, any plans you have to further decrease it? Because this is a concern of ours. We've made some great gains, and we feel that we're uh, potentially going to shift away from that uh, should we lose some more air. As far as uh, flight hours, is that what your concern is? Flight hours and assets, okay. yes. So uh, we execute about 95,000 flight hours a year. That's been a pretty consistent number with us. There has been more movement. I mean, as Tucson has gained a more of a control of their border than it was 10 years ago when the flight hours were much higher than they are right now. But in a process of of the of actually Tucson and the, and them getting a hold of and more maintenance of their border, we've seen a shift in flows to South Texas. So there has been more of a there has been a movement of flight hours and funding towards the South Texas area. I don't necessarily foresee Arizona to drop any further than it is right now, and I don't believe um, that this drop in, in any way shows a lack of interest from Air and Marine in, into that area. Tucson, as it is, is the largest branch we have. Yeah. Um, I would probably say the agents are somewhere around uh, 80 total. It has more air assets than anybody else, and it also flies more than anybody else. So it is still a, it's a center cog for us in that western side of the United States. It has a, a large diversity of platforms. Well, first of all, the UAS flies out of there at our office. It has more flight hours than any other. We have Blackhawks that fly. We have citations for air interdictions, and we have... Uh, AS 350s and small fixed wing aircraft. So it is it is a hub for us in the Southwest region. Chief Luck, do you got any uh, comments on that? 
I would just add, based on your uh, opening uh, statements, that we are testing other things, other unmanned aerial systems uh, to fill a gap, uh, and we're going to test some in, uh, with a small UAS uh, in Arizona here coming next month. So that is a gap filler, too, for needed air requirements in, in southern Arizona and in South Texas, and we're also testing them in, in Swanton, Vermont. Uh, to see what the capability is. So we've come uh, quite a long ways with regard to SUAS and filling gaps and air requirements. Great, thanks. Uh, continuing on the air discussion, uh, the Vader technology has been uh, helpful, but the feedback that uh, we get when I go down and visit is uh, oftentimes there's uh, several limitations, obviously, to the unmanned aerial systems as to when they can fly and when that information is available. And uh, we've talked several times uh, since I've been the subcommittee chair about pushing forward to also have that capability on manned aircraft. And I know you're piloting that, pardon the pun, uh, but can you give an update on the process of uh, getting the Vader technology on manned aircraft to provide more flexibility? Well, first, let me say that we are, we are hoping to expand the UAS capabilities with Vader in Sierra Vista. We're very close to moving it to a 24 by 5 operation. When you probably visited and throughout this year, it was a 16 by 5. So, you know, what happens with weather for that is we do exactly what you mentioned before. You get affected by weather for both takeoffs and landings. If we move to a 5 by 24 model, we can launch and recover around those weather patterns. We've done a few experiments with that on 24 by 5, and we get massive bumps in flight hour availability. So that is our initial plan going forward. As far as putting the Vader on a manned asset, yeah, that is, we haven't, that is a bit out. Those are a few years out from ever have, for having that available. Uh, so that's not being office. piloted right now? It is being piloted, but it's not, it's not, there's nothing physical right now I could tell you about. Okay. So the timeline for even knowing whether that's a possibility you're, you're saying is several years? I don't believe it could be seven years, but can I Several, get, sorry, several, no. not seven. No, can I get you a, a better timeline on that? Absolutely. No, this is something we've been you know, interested in for a while, so it'd be helpful to understand the plan for that and the timing for testing, evaluation, and all that. So uh, we're going to have a second round here. I'm running out of my time, so I'll now uh, recognize uh, Mr. Korea for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Gambler, a couple of questions. What were the lessons from the failed SBI uh, net? Has CBP fixed the management cost and schedule problems that led to the failure of SBI net? And uh, could, could we see more of the same with ongoing and future CBP technology acquisitions? Sure, I'll answer the middle question first, if that's okay, in terms of the, the, the cost and schedule. Uh, we have seen uh, improvements, particularly in CBP's schedules for some of the different land-based surveillance technologies. Uh, so that's that's been a positive step that CBP has made toward addressing our recommendations. In terms of the life cycle cost estimate, for specifically for the RVSS program, um, CBP and DHS have worked to uh, conduct an independent life cycle cost cost estimate and tried to reconcile that to the uh, cost estimate that, that CBP has for the RVSS. And we'll be working with CBP to get documentation of that and, and take a look at it. Uh, so we have seen progress being made on both schedules and estimates, and, and that progress is really positive. In terms of your broader uh, question, ranking member, about uh, lessons learned and um, and steps going forward. I think there's two key themes or lessons learned from our work looking at CBP's technology programs. The first is that it's it's important for CBP to make sure the tech, technology programs go through the DHS acquisition management process uh, fully and completely. DHS's acquisition management process, it's a robust, valid, knowledge-based process, but CBP hasn't always ensured that technology programs have moved through that process consistently. And so they need to apply the acquisition management process consistently to their technology programs. And secondly, and as I mentioned in, in my oral statement, it's important for CBP to put in place the metrics that we've been recommending for several years now so that they can really assess uh, what we're getting out of our investments in technologies. So those are the two things that we see as lessons learned and are important things for CBP to focus on going forward. Thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Gambler. A recent GAO report uh, concluded that CBP lacked the metrics necessary to show whether or how the existing border wall contributes to border security. Uh, does it make sense to move forward with President Trump's multi-billion dollar uh, wall before CBP can show what kind of return the American taxpayers 
would get on their investment, if any? Uh, and is it possible, uh, less costly, to have less intrusive border security measures uh, that would be more effective? Uh, ranking member, that question gets at uh, two key findings from GAO's work on infrastructure and technology along the border. The first is we do think it's important for CBP to put metrics in place both for uh, tactical infrastructure to include uh, the fencing that's been deployed um, as well as technologies that I've mentioned. Um, the other uh, important uh, theme from our work is, uh, and we've reported on this previously um, as it relates to, to technologies, is the need for CBP to be able to document um, the investments it's making and why it's choosing to put um, certain technologies or certain assets in, in certain places. So um, seeing that documentation about um, the, the types and locations and quantities of things that are being deployed is uh, an important part of planning for these types of acquisitions. Just as a follow-up comment, 20 years ago in Los Angeles, a, a seizure of $2 billion of cash and uh, drugs occurred, semi-truck stop, regular coming in and off, dropping you know tons of drugs. Those were not going you know, through the terrain. They're going through the border, border checkpoints. Yesterday, San Antonio, Texas, about 20 undocumented individuals in a semi. And so my point is, you've got a wall, yet you've got most of the traffic, according to most of the folks I've talked to at the border, through the checkpoints, existing border checkpoints. So, you know, those are my questions. Do you invest on the border or do you invest in better x ray machines at the border crossing uh, stations? Comment or statement? Thank you. I, I think that's absolutely uh, the the right questions that we should be asking. Uh, it's important for CBP to be able to provide information on their plans so that decision makers in Congress can evaluate those plans and determine what would be the most effective use of resources. So I think you're, you're asking and a very important question uh, about uh, technology and infrastructure deployments. Thank you. Madam Chair, I yield. Anyone else back? Chair, I recognize Mr. Smith for Texas. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you all for your expertise and your dedication to our country. Uh, it really is a privilege for us to hear you all today. Uh, you're on the front lines. You know firsthand what's going on. Uh, Mr. Luck, before I address some questions to you, uh, let me preface the questions by saying that when I was first elected, I represented over 100 miles of Texas-Mexico border, and that sort of riveted my attention on the particular subject. And over the years, I've seen some examples of what works and does not work. And uh, we all know we need a combination of physical structure, personnel, and technology. In San Diego, for example, you have a double fence that has succeeded in stopping illegal immigration by about 95%. Uh, years ago, uh, I know you were in the El Paso sector, uh, chief of operations there, but a former member of Congress, Sylvester Reyes, was once the uh, border sector chief there. And he stationed Border Patrol agents very, very close together. I don't know if it was 100 yards or whatever. Uh, and it was personnel intensive, but he stopped illegal immigration almost entirely. So that was an example of how that worked. I know in Texas a number of years ago, we tried at great cost a virtual fence and basically had to abandon it in part because of vandalism by the illegal immigrants, in part because of false positives by the censors, and in part because we didn't have enough Border Patrol agents backing up the technology. So I know technology has improved since then, and I guess I'm saying that uh, there are parts of the border that lend themselves more to one than another, perhaps. I wanted to ask you where you thought um, it would be most beneficial to have a physical structure along the border, where you thought it might be most beneficial to have uh, technology along the border. Thank you for the question, sir. Um, it depends on the terrain and it depends on the threat. Uh, so in the urban areas, we want to have something that slows down the volume, the, the traffic flow. So we want to have a, a persistent impedance or impedance and denial system, such as a physical barrier. Mm -hmm. uh, but that in itself doesn't work uh, on its own. So it's a part of a package that we are concentrating on as part of our new uh, mm -hmm. strategy as it relates to the executive order and, and it relates to operational control. The first part of that is, of course, uh, the, the uh, uh, impedance and denial, the deterrence, 
uh, and, and, mm -hmm. and so forth. And then we have uh, the domain awareness. That's knowing what we're going to do and what assets, and that's the technology piece. Mm -hmm. The access and, and mobility and, and having uh, uh, direct access to the border and roads and infrastructure is a third piece. And the last piece, of course, is the agents. So it's a, it's a combination of all four of those uh, master capabilities mm -hmm. that gets us to the operational control that we're looking for. And that depends on the location and the threat. And right. so in, in, in California, as you mentioned, the physical barrier ha helps stop the flow, helps displace the, the traffic so that we, have, we can use technology assets, situational awareness to detect, detect that traffic, and then and bring it to a law enforcement right. resolution. Uh, would, it be, um, would it be accurate to summarize what you just said as, as, as uh, saying that in the urban areas and high traffic areas, a physical structure is necessary, and in other areas, maybe it would be more technology than physical structure? That is accurate, sir. That's okay. exactly what it was. And uh, last week, the president said something along the lines of seven to 900 miles of physical structure along the border, roughly half the border. It's 2,000 mile border on the, south, on the southern part of the United States. But um, we have some fencing in place, obviously, some single, some double, some concrete. Um, but would that seven to 900 miles sound about right for where we need a physical structure? To be honest, sir, we haven't gotten that far. We okay. haven't gotten that far in determining what the years to follow will give us right. based on the budget. What we do have is a plan for 17, a plan for 18, and then a, 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 a plan for 19 to 23. So, Okay. Let's take the outside plan, 19 to 23. How many miles of physical structure are anticipated by then? We, d we don't have that number yet. Oh, you don't? That, that is something okay. that we're still, we're still developing. Okay. And, and, and there's a lot of variables that go into that. As we put impedance and denial on the border and other systems to back that up, it may have a, 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 a trend of different things yeah. that'll happen as a result. The adversary yeah. does have a, a, has a vote in this. Right. And so we don't want to put specifically from point A to point B if the need isn't there. Understand. If you look at the uh, urban areas and if you look at the high traffic areas, you're going to come up with several hundred miles. I don't know exactly what it would be either, but uh, clearly there is a role for the fencing, sometimes a double fencing, which has worked particularly well on the southern border. I think. Absolutely, sir. Okay. That as well as, as in some areas, a, a, a patrol area that, that's in between, right? Right. Uh, Correct. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lutt. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, gentlemen. Yields back. Chair, now recognize Ms. Barragan. Um, thank you. Um, Mr. Michelini, I represent the Port of Los Angeles, and drones are becoming more prevalent in commercial and personal use, sometimes coming into the land and airspace of ports and other security-sensitive entry points. How is CBP dealing with the security issues these drones present at ports, and is CBP working with the TSA and local law enforcement to address this problem? CBP is working with, uh, with the FAA on drones. Um, those, small, those small drones are still mostly a, a uh, FAA concern. Um, the lower, those aircraft aren't supposed to fly, I mean, above 500 feet, so they can sort themselves out from, from a, a manned aircraft. Specifically around ports of entry, um, I'm, I'm not really, I'm not up to speed on what any kind of CBP actions have done in that regard. Okay, does anybody else on the panel want to add anything to that or kind of address if there's any jurisdictional issues that need to be resolved? No, I'm not aware of any jurisdictional issues, but I am aware that in the ports and in the critical infrastructure, we do work very closely with the local law enforcement to respond to any uh, information that may be, in, you know, indicate that there's a drone activity in the area, but I'm not aware of any jurisdictional issues. Okay. Um, Mr. Scott, um, I'm sorry, Mr. Luck. <laughs> Um, what cyber vulnerabilities has CBP identified in the Arizona Border Surveillance Technology Plan, and what is CBP's cybersecurity strategy for the Southwest Border Technology Plan? Could you repeat that, please? Sure. What cyber vulnerabilities has CBP identified in the Arizona Border Surveillance Technology Plan, the ATP? And what is CBP's cybersecurity strategy for the Southwest Border Technology Plan? I, I would have to get back to you on that. I, I, I don't have an answer for that question. 
Okay. If you could um, Absolutely. follow up, that would be great. Right. Um, okay, let's, uh, Mr. Luck. Does CBP have the documented plan or strategy to achieve situational awareness along our borders? Yes, ma'am, and we get that through our, our, resource, our requirements management process, and part of that is our CGAP, uh, Capability Gap Assessment Process, that we use to bring in what the gaps are in coverage and what gaps are that needed to be filled uh, along the border. And then from there, and that's a bottom-up approach, and from there we decide on what the best courses of action are, whether that's surveillance technology or whether that's uh, 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 a system or, or a physical barrier. Okay, and Ms. Gambler, in March of 2014, the GAO reported that the CBP schedules and life cycle cost estimates for the Arizona Border Surveillance Technology Plan and its three highest cost programs which represented 97% of the plan's total estimated costs, met some but not all best practices. GAO recommended that CBP ensure that its schedules and cost estimates more fully address best practices, such as validating cost estimates with independent estimates, and DHS concurred. What more remains to be done? Uh, yes, Congresswoman. On the schedules themselves, uh, CBP has provided us with uh, updated schedules, and they have shown uh, significant improvements in quality. So we are continuing to look at those uh, schedules to determine the extent to which they, uh, the revised schedules fully meet the intent of our, our recommendation. As it relates to the life cycle cost estimates, uh, I'd I uh, want to talk about the estimates for two different programs, the RVSS and the IFTs. For the RVSS, DHS and CBP, DHS has conducted an independent life cycle cost estimate for the RVSS and has been working with CBP to reconcile those two estimates. We'll be obtaining follow-up documentation from uh, CBP and DHS on that effort and can certainly follow up with you after we've had a, a chance to, to look at that and make our own analysis. For the IFTs, we have uh, not seen that CBP has uh, yet done an independent uh, life cycle cost estimate for that program. And uh, in line with what we've recommended, we think it's important they do so. And do you have an estimate of a timeline on when this might be done and we have something back? Uh, with regard to us looking at the, uh, uh, um, the independent life cycle cost estimate and the reconciliation with the RVSS, we'll be, we're actually following up, up with CBP now on that. So hopefully we can get back to you uh, on that pretty quickly. Great. Thank you. I yield back. Chairman, I recognize Mr. Hurd from Texas for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman, for your focus on this important issue. And I'd like to echo my colleagues in thanking the panelists for, for being here. Um, with 820 miles of the border, um, I recognize the difficulty of y'all's task. Uh, having spent nine and a half years as an undercover officer chasing terrorists, nuclear weapon proliferators, uh, you name it, um, I recognize um, how difficult it is to secure our border. And I'm, I was just proud that one of my first, my first bill signed the law was actually something that helped Border Patrol agents make sure their pay wasn't getting cut. Uh, so this is something that's, that's very important to me. Um, it's 2017, and I think we, as a government, should have done a better job of helping y'all deploy technology along the border to do your jobs. And, and I guess my, my first question is, and maybe this goes to you first, Mr. Luck, and Mr. Owen, if you have opinions, I'd welcome that as well. Currently, right now, how is computer vision being used in border security? Computer vision. Yes, sir. Could you help me address that? Sure. Um, you know, we, we have these fixed towers. We have sensor technology. We have all this data that's coming in. Um, are we using automated tools um, in order to determine um, whether the movement of something is dangerous or is something that requires interdiction by Border Patrol? Yes, I mean, we're doing some predictive stuff. Uh, as, as you may know, that uh, we are using our partners. We have agents assigned 
uh, to, to extend our borders, and we're using systems with our partners in different countries uh, to help to predict what the traffic flows will be. So those are all, uh, and collecting information and using that information mm -hmm. to help us better prepare for what's coming to the border. And, and so we are using that. The systems that we use for processing has been has evolved uh, to, to uh, comment on Ms. Gambler's uh, comments on how we track the assets that we do use. Uh, that has been uh, implemented into our E3 system. And, and so we are using a lot of array of, uh, there is a lot of data coming in the 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 uh, intelligence agents that are out there mm -hmm. have have an apparatus in either their sectors or at the headquarters uh, through operation uh, uh, for, through our uh, office of intelligence to be able to sure. collate the data sure. that they get in the intelligence. Gotcha, gotcha. And and so so how much how much of the current system automates detection? Right. In 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 this day and age, um, we can deploy any number of systems, LIDAR, radar, um, um, fiber optic cable to detect a bunny rabbit from a human. Um, and we should be able to automate that event to where a computer can tell us that it was in a bunny rabbit or a deer or a cow. And I hope we can say if it was a cow with fever tick or not with fever tick, but that's a whole nother question in South Texas. Um, is that being done? As far as the systems we have with integrated fixed towers and some of our uh, mobile surveillance capabilities, that is being done. With, we have multiple layers. You have the radars, and then you have the cameras that skew to the movement, and an alarm that'll go off in the control room that'll say, instead of 100 cameras that a, a, an officer or an agent has to look at, there's an alarm that goes off that says there's been an, an, an incursion, gotcha. and then it skews over and, and it helps with that. So that's the automation that we're looking for. We have some work to do to, to connect everything so that it all talks together and with all the systems that we have amongst the components, but that's so, what we're so trying So do you have an integrated picture back at headquarters, or does the um, Joint Task Force West have an integrated picture down in San Antonio uh, on the southwestern border? They don't have an integrated picture that they can queue to to uh, to look at the activity gotcha. and and see that. And does the individual agent on the ground look? I, I was recently um, in Del Rio, humping through some Carrizo cane, and it's it's not a it's not a pleasant experience, um, especially at 105 degree weather. Um, does if there was a detection event? Does that individual agent that may be patrolling that part of the sector, do they get notification um, themselves? Yes, through our ICAD system. And, and, and is that a um, walkie-talkie? What's the ICAD system? Right, the ICAD system is, a, is the system that they use in dispatch, and when a sensor, an underground sensor goes off, it'll automatically hit, and they'll call it out, and the agent can respond to it. That's what they use. Madam Chair, are we going to have another round? Okay, great. I yield back the time I do not have. Thanks, the gentleman yields back. We are starting a second round. I, I want to actually continue on with that line of questioning. Situational awareness to the actual agent is something I've been pushing on since I've been the chairwoman of the subcommittee. Uh, if we are bringing uh, information together, but it's back in the operations center, but the person out there on the ground doesn't have that, you don't want to overload them with information, but decision quality information for them is key. And getting that over voice is not ideal, uh, you know, given the technologies that we have. Uh, similarly, the, the mobile uh, surveillance cameras, last time I was out there, we were talking about how just the person at the truck has that situational awareness. So what sort of uh, initiatives are ongoing related to bringing the data and information together in a fused way, uh, but then also providing tact appropriate information to the agents so their SA is increased as they're out there putting their lives on the line? One of the things that we are working with now in the platform that we're using is, is tracking sign cutting, uh, sign cutting and modeling system. And, and what that does is when an event takes place, uh, all, automatically uh, when the agent calls in, hey, I've got a, a sign of three that I'm working, automatically that starts a, 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 a track. Uh, either geo, uh, geospatial track or, or geolocator track of where that agent is and what he's doing. And so what it does is it fills in the gaps and then other technology can be used to, to assist him in that arena. And so they're, they're doing it a lot and it tracks uh, what the movements are, what, util what technology is utilized and things can be used 
Now, what we want to do, and, and that then transfers over when the, when the agent makes an arrest, that transfers over to uh, uh, the E3 processing system so that it can be used to, to uh, capture all the event that took place. But the agent is still predominantly getting information by voice is the point, right? I right. mean, is there any sort of requirement or something in the works for blue force tracking, again, some sort of iPad-like, wristwatch-like situational awareness for the agent. It, we had a friendly fire death in our in our sector. Uh, you know that just builds their situational awareness so they can see where's the good guys, where's the bad guys, what's going on. So it's not just the guys in the air-conditioned ops center that are seeing that. Right, and what we we know that that's a gap, and we're trying to do that. Some of that is 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 gaps in communication and having access to systems that track that, like a, like a down screen. We're using it in some areas uh, for SUAS, for example. The, the agent has the ability to see with the, with the uh, SUASCs, but as far as the ability to uh, have something on them that can, that can be used to, to track it, there's comms issues with that, and there's an expense. Blue Force tracking, of course, is, has, has to be uh, negotiated with the union to try to get that as part of, uh, of the picture. So, so, there is, so is what you're saying is there's no requirement or, you know, technology development in, in its process or funded to specifically provide increased situational awareness to the agent on the ground? Like, I, I know you're talking about some ideas, but there's, we don't actually have a program or a system or a requirement that's moving any of that forward right now? Not that I know of, ma'am, to be honest with you. Okay, following up on the tactical UAVs, you, ta you talked about it. Can you uh, give me a little update? Uh, your testing in Arizona, uh, upcoming, where are you doing that? Okay, so so what we've done with, with the UAV is we worked with partnership with uh, Air and Marine. Yep. We've got a, uh, an MOU in place with the Federal Aviation Administration, so they we can test those. We have bought a suite of uh, different capabilities, one being the uh, quadcopter that can be up in the air for about 30 minutes or so. Mm -hmm. The other is a, is a Raven type where it can be longer distance for a longer time. And then the other one has got a, a three hour time span. We bought some of those and now we want to test those in an operational testing environment uh, in Arizona, in South Texas, and in Swanton, Vermont coming up in, in September. Okay, so would you, can you we follow up as to where you're doing that in Arizona? I might want to go out and s check Absol it out. Absolutely. Uh, also, to uh, go back on uh, Ms. Barragon's uh, line of questioning, are you considering the cybersecurity elements of that? If you're just uh, off the shelves, can be great for quickly getting capabilities to the agents, but if they can be easily jammed or intercepted yes, or taken over. And that's part of it, and we're reaching out to industry and, and some of the things going on in uh, Silicon Valley to help with the sensors and so forth. Great, and I want to reiterate, uh, I've brought it up uh, several times, in southern Arizona, right near the border, we do have Cochise College with a very robust uh, UAV training capability. They have been wanting to partner with you all on this tactical UAV issue. Uh, we've made some introductions. I think not everybody in the bureaucracy is talking to the right people, but we would love to follow up with that, especially during your testing and evaluation, very so good. that you're not reinventing the wheel if there's training capabilities out there already. Very good. And you're back for this round, and Mr. Correa, you're up for another five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just wanted to get back to Ms. Gambler. I uh, didn't quite understand your answer when I asked if CBP had the matrix necessary to assess the effectiveness of a, an, the existing border wall and possibly a, a proposed border wall. Uh, Do we have the matrix? CBP uh, does not currently have uh, metrics in place to assess the contributions that existing fencing is uh, making to uh, border security efforts. That's what we reported on uh, in our report on existing fencing earlier this year, and we recommended that uh, CBP uh, put in place those metrics to include using the existing data they have um, to be able to assess um, uh, the what contributions fencing is having to border security. Thank you. Question to the panel, if I may. Um, my prior life as a chair of select committee in California in the Senate of California, Mexico, I took a number of tours of the border area, San Isidro, San Diego. I noticed the California Highway Patrol has a, has a station there, where I believe every semi truck that comes through is checked for safety every quarter to make sure they're thoroughly, every truck that comes by is is up to California vehicle code. Uh, number two, every semi, I believe, is checked for radiation. 
um, and they're also checked for other, you know, possible issues. Um, my question to you is, um, given that situation, that investment the state of California has made in assuring the safety of Californians, uh, do you have that same relationship with the other border states in terms of coordinating, making sure you share information f from California, New Mexico, Arizona, and Texas? Well, sir, I will tell you at all the ports of entry along the Southwest border, it's very common to find the state authorities just outside our compound looking at the trucks for the, the roadworthiness, the safety issues, as you mentioned there. As for the radiation screening, that is a function that we perform within the ports of entry. Every truck, every passenger vehicle coming into the United States is first screened for radiation before it ever can leave the port. So we've been doing that since about 2002. And, and again, most people aren't aware of that activity that takes place. We do coordinate with the state transportation police outside those gates on different activities and things of that nature. So that is a, what you see in California is very common along the larger land border crossings along the Mexican border. So I guess my question is, so I, I assume you do communicate with local state and uh, authorities in terms of coordinating your data to make sure if there's any patterns there, you actually can pick them up. In, in terms of? Patterns of possible illicit activity. Okay. Patterns we do, again, and we are members of the various task forces that work along the southwest border where that information is shared in terms of the tactics, what we're finding, the trends, and things of that nature. So I would argue that on the field operations side, and I'm sure on the Border Patrol side, communication with the state and local authorities along the border region is, is, is very strong. Secretary Kelly has mentioned that uh, right now coordination, cooperation with Mexican authorities is actually very good. Um, Again, my prior life, I took a tour of the southern Mexican border. I noticed most of the vehicles coming into Mexico from south of Mexico were x-rayed. A lot of that data was then digitalized, sent to Mexico City, and I believe it was shared with Langley. So it added a whole layer of multi-layered defense. Is that relationship still there? Does it exist? Has it expanded? Uh, tell me, how are we working with our partners, not only south of the border, but around the world? in terms of enhanced security, as uh, Secretary Kelly has said, you know, if, this, if those things, items get to the border, mm -hmm. you've already kind of lost. You've got to get interdict uh, those illicit items before they actually get to the border. Right. Well, I will tell you that within the Office of Field Operations, we have very strong partnerships at, at, at 52 seaports around the globe as part of our container security initiative where we identify high-risk shipments before they're headed this way. We have partnerships in Colombia, in Honduras, uh, in Panama that are very effective in terms of the narcotics interdiction. The activities at the port of entry, I think in the last three years since I've been in this position, uh, very much uh, improved relationship with the Mexican authorities to the point that in several locations in Arizona, we have Mexican customs that are in the U.S. conducting joint inspections with us as part of a unified cargo inspection process. Uh, reduces some redundancies. It helps facilitate the lawful trade and travel. I've uh, been very, very effective within Arizona. So I can speak for the border, for the field operations. The relationship with Mexico is very strong and defer to the chief on. I'm running out of time. So very quickly, I would say it'd be good to create a matrix to assess how effective that relationship is in stopping uh, and inspecting and being effective at the border. Thank you very much. I yield, Madam Chair. Gentleman yields. Chair, I recognize Mr. Hurd for Texas. Or five Thank minutes. You. Thank you, Chairwoman. And uh, again, Mr. Luck, Mr. Owen, same question for both of you all. Um, you know, take a minute, minute and a half. Um, describe, Mr. Luck, describe your dream tech scenario for the CBP of tomorrow. My tech scenario would be having the right mixture of, based on the threat, having the right mixture of technology and, and we can't do it alone, no piece of technology you've ever, has ever made an apprehension, uh, that informs and talks to all of the other component pieces that we have within CBP. And, and so that that information is shared immediately to all components and agents and officers who need it. That would be my dream scenario. We have systems out there that are, that are standalone systems that we would need that, in my view, need, we need to have speak to one another and, and share that information with whatever piece of technology that is so that we're not redundant in those efforts and that we know exactly we have the same situational awareness regarding uh, re uh, 
regardless of who that uh, operating entity is. Good copy. And, and, and Mr. Luck, please correct me if I'm wrong. I, I feel like the existing technology that's being used, um, there is an, an overwhelm, there is too much of an operating burden on the person using it. Um, we need technology that is a little bit more user friendly. Um, we need to make sure that this is integrated, as you say, across the various elements, not just within a team within a particular sector, but uh, across sectors and even back at headquarters. And as Chairwoman McSally was saying, getting that information in the hands of the individual agent, whether they're in their vehicle, on foot, humping through Carrizo Cane, and that they, that allows them to do the do only what they can do. The hardest part, the interdiction. In anything that I described, am I out of line? No, sir. That's that's appropriate. Good copy. And we're trying to get you some some uh, dinero to do all this, uh, by the way. And and um, that's why I get frustrated with all this talk about a wall, um, because 24.5 million dollars a mile. That's a lot of money. Um, you can deploy a lot of off-the-shelf technology to do what I just described for half a million dollars a mile. And if we add this out to the additional 1,350 um, miles of the border that doesn't have um, um, fencing, that's $33 billion. Um, I can use $32 billion of that for a lot of other things, like give y'all's folks um, more pay because for the hard work that they do. Give Mr. Michelini some more um, air assets to do what he does. And that's, that's where we're trying to go with this idea of a smart wall um, that leverages technology to make sure the men and women in Border Patrol are doing their thing. Um, Mr. Owen, same question to you. Yes, sir. Well, the technology uh, that really is the cornerstone of our interdiction activities in the ports of entry is the large-scale, non-intrusive inspection technology. What we need is, is technology that has the capability to keep that cargo flowing. Mm -hmm. On the passenger side, we have drive-through low-energy systems where the passengers, the travelers, can stay in the car as we scan the car safely for the presence of any contraband. Those have been a game-changer for us in the passenger arena. What we have on the horizon and what we're working with our science and technology directorate as well as some of the vendors, manufacturers, is a similar drive-through systems for cargo. The challenge we have with cargo trucks now is you generally have a single, cell, a single energy system. You have to take the driver out of the cab. You can't use a high energy system on the driver. That slows things down. So with those current systems, only about seven trucks an hour can be scanned. The technology that's on the horizon that I really see as a game changer for our cargo inspections is a multi-energy system that you can ratchet down to a low energy version to scan the cab. And as the driver and the cab clears, you ratchet up the energy level to high energy to mm -hmm. penetrate the cargo. That will allow the trucks to continue to keep moving, not have to come to a stop. We estimate 10 times as many inspections can be done an hour with that technology. That's great. So that is on the horizon. We're looking at several locations where we'll be deploying that, and I really see that as a game changer for us in terms of our interdiction efforts in cargo shipments. Chairwoman, I think we should put that on the list. Um, and my, 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 yeah, my, my, my final question, and maybe it's for you, Mr. Luck or, or Ms. Gambler, how much money do we spend you know, in a year here to this date on tunnel detection. I don't know how much money we spend. I know that we're working a lot with partners on, on most recent tunnel detection capability. It is a vulnerability and a threat that we need to really think seriously about. Uh, we're working with industry. We're certainly working with our partners from Israel uh, to give us the latest and greatest, and we have a, a, an apparatus to kind of get that best technology. And we, we, we're worried about tunnel detection under physical barriers like the existing fencing we have. Is that correct? Yes, we are. And, and part of the plan for future fencing would be to put fiber optics in there to, okay. to help with that. And I would just add, I think we may have some data on that, and I would be happy to, to follow up with your office and provide what we have. We will as well. Thank you all very much. Thank you for the indulgement. Absolutely. Indulgement, sure um, Chairwoman. Recognize Mr. Rutherford for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I am particularly <clears throat> drawn to the, um, to the circle here, the apprehension life cycle, as, as you all call it, because I've often said 
the same thing about this wall concept that, uh, you know, a wall is not a barrier. It's just an impediment. And uh, what we need is to provide you with the technology that you can detect, track, apprehend, and uh, in, in a secure way, uh, these folks who are coming over the border. Let, let me ask, um, the, the technology, it, it, when, when we visited the, the southern border specifically, uh, it seemed like as far as Fort Huachuca, they had pretty good um, integration of uh, communications and intelligence uh, going on. Further east of that, the Rio Grande Valley, there didn't seem to, to have been as much um, in the way of um, technology being applied. It, it almost looked like they, they ran out of money or something in this, you know, or, or maybe it's just in the next phase, but, but it just didn't seem like the Rio Grande Valley was getting the attention that, I, that, that uh, the, the other areas that, that we had observed uh, had. Can, can, Mr. Luck, can you speak to that, the needs specifically in the Rio Grande Valley? Yes, sir. Uh, and, and you're right. We didn't have enough attention on the Rio Grande Valley because the <clears throat> traffic was coming through Arizona. And so we were, our technology lay down, and these things take time. And, and some of these uh, options take, take more time than others. Uh, we're trying to get Arizona under control. So in, in, now the focus is on the Rio Grande Valley. And so we're trying to bring technology in there, and we will be bringing technology in there in the way of remote video surveillance systems and our ability to do persistent surveillance. Uh, we do have the DOD reuse uh, uh, tactical aerostats there that have been very, very good. We have the help from our partners in Air and Marine with some of the systems and sensors that they have as far as flight hours. And now we're trying to concentrate and move into uh, it's about persistent surveillance technology, relocatable towers. That's what we want to move into RGB. We can do it quicker, and we, they, they have the, the sophisticated camera systems that will give those agents more situational awareness. And in that area, as you know, the Carrizo Cane problem, we have to have height mm -hmm. to be able to see into that. And so we're also testing different technologies that will maybe help us get – uh, more of a situational awareness in that Cariso cane, such as foliage penetrating radars and, and things of that nature to try to test new things that helps us get that better picture. But that's what we're, we're, we're recognizing that we need to have more technology in, in Rio Grande Valley. And, and I believe there's a significant in, increase in the technology budget uh, to help with that, correct? Yes, and we thank this committee. So, and, and let me ask, because another piece of the, the, the life cycle, as you call it, um, it, the apprehension phase of that takes boots on the ground. Absolutely. I mean, you just have to have boots on the ground. It's just that simple. Yes, sir. Uh, is, is there anything that we can do to help you all in that process, uh, acquiring more boots for the ground? The training, the recruitment, uh, all of that. We're working very, very diligently with that. HRM has made a lot of advances, over 40 improvements in their pre-employment process. Uh, we're doing some things with, uh, with waivers, with, uh, with dedicated people that have uh, proven their integrity, with waivers mm -hmm. of the polygraph. So, yeah. and there's a Is robust, that helping? Yes, sir. And okay. there's a robust good. effort towards uh, recruitment right now. Very good. Uh, Madam Chair, I'll yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yells back. I'm going to do one more round, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, great. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Gamble, you talked about, um, in several hearings, we've talked about the um, starting to measure the uh, use of technology in apprehensions in order to better understand the metrics of whether the technology is helping. Do we have any assessments? I mean, we've been talking about this for over a year since I've been the subcommittee chair. Do we have any assessments of how any of the technologies are assisting in the apprehensions, or do we not yet have enough time of doing that? So in response to the recommendation that we made in our report on surveillance technologies from a few years ago, Chairwoman, uh, CBP has uh, provided us with uh, one sample of, of uh, how they've uh, tried to, to look at metrics. And so we've been evaluating that, but we need to see them do it more systematically for uh, across the border. And so uh, in order to address a recommendation, we really need to, to see that CBP and Border Patrol are looking at this from a more systematic perspective. Got it. Thanks. 
Uh, and I'm wondering, uh, Mr. Luck, um, the deployment of IFTs and some of the other technology more recently in um, Arizona, is there any sort of assessments on uh, that you could, short-term assessments on the effectiveness of that? Obviously, you don't want correlation to equal causality because you don't know whether you're deterring activity or whether things are shifting for different reasons, but do you have any sort of feedback on how the IFTs and other technology are working in Arizona? So it, the reports that I'm getting from the short time that it, they've been on live with the last uh, towers in IFT and Douglas, uh, the view sheds and the area that they can cover and the, and the workability of those systems are, are functioning properly and is a great asset and a needed asset in those environments. MSCs, all the RVSS, mm -hmm. the refresh that we're doing uh, periodically for the RVSS until we can get to the replacement is, is, is really working well in Arizona and, and other places as well. Great. So that at this point, that's anecdotal, obviously, but I mean, it's good feedback from those that are out there in charge building their situation. Where it's going to be helpful to figure out the metrics or the measurement, right, of and yeah. the integration with the other systems. Is that fair, Ms. Gambler? Uh, that's right, and um, we are happy to, you know, help provide feedback to CBP on that process as well as they're mm -hmm. developing metrics. That's something that we've talked about and offered in the past. Great. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Ma'am, if I could yeah. just uh, add on to the, the status of one of the recommendations from the GAO as far as our system, E3, our processing system, and the ability for agents to use a check down box as, as a response to adding technology to the apprehension in the processing phase, yeah. that has been accomplished and is working well. So they have a, they have a, a drop down box that has to be checked. Uh, regarding what uh, technology and other assets, and they can make multiple choices as as uh, as it relates to the apprehension. That's great, uh, Mr. Owen. You talked about um, technology that uh, is maybe on the cutting edge here, the multi-energy system, um, and uh, the NII technology being helpful. But the reality is, we still have massive amounts of uh, opioids, synthetic opioids, uh, the hard the hard drugs that are you know killing Americans right now in a in a crisis level coming mostly through the ports of entry. So what what other technologies do we need um, in order to get what we're missing? I mean, we know what we're getting, but we obviously, we're obviously missing a lot still because, uh, because of the uh, epidemic that we have going on in our country. So yes. what else, what else it, do we need? Yes, it, it's very challenging. I mean, clearly they hide in the numbers. 76 million passenger vehicles that crossed the southwest border last year and another 6 million trucks. Uh, it's very difficult to, to inspect all of those, so we rely on intelligence, we rely on our advanced targeting capabilities, the advanced information that we have, and then oftentimes it comes down to the instruction in, instinct and training of the officers on primary when they just sense something is wrong and they send those individuals. The current fentanyl challenge is, is compounded by with the, the two main pathways. We have the fentanyl from China that is primarily entering through the international mail system as well as the express courier hubs. And the volume is just overwhelming in that environment. E-commerce continues to skyrocket. They grew about 360 million parcels last year and, 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 and significantly increased this year. So very, very difficult in that environment. And as well as, as on the southwest border, they hide in the numbers. I think we have very dedicated men and women that use all of the tools that this committee and, and, and others have provided us. I think we are effective. Uh, but there is stuff that gets through, no doubt. What's your sense? Um, actually, I think it's important for people to realize that the coming in from China through yeah. uh, e-commerce, what's your sense of the percentage that's coming through that versus coming up through the border? I'm not sure I have a percentage. I, I can tell you, though, that the testing that we've done, the purity of the Chinese fentanyl coming through the mail and through the express is, is very close to 100%. It is very, very strong, very, very deadly. The purity of the fentanyl coming across the southwest border is much less. Still a very significant threat, but you've got two different challenges that you're dealing with. Hopefully with our engagement with our international partners, we'll see some, some relief in that area as well. And thanks for highlighting that. Uh, time's up. Uh, Chair, now recognize Mr. Korea. Thank you, Madam Chair. Very quickly again to Ms. Gambler. What remains to be done in order for the agency to better measure the effectiveness of its capabilities? Is CBP using all of the tools available in the best way possible? both for border security and measuring performance. And I say that from, from the following perspective, that uh, um, we talk about a lot of things we can do at the borders. Smart border inland ports, um, <clears throat> new technology that my opening remarks, I talked about some of the agents uh, not being able to talk to each other. They could see each other, but the communication devices didn't, uh, weren't effective. 
And that reminds me of the Grenada invasion, you know, a couple of decades ago. We still have that same situation. Uh, meat and potatoes, basically investing in common everyday technology to make our personnel much more effective. Uh, Multi-energy system that you're talking about, Mr. Owen. Uh, I took a tour of a San Diego, I'm not gonna mention the name, uh, of a manufacturer in San Diego. They apparently had deployed some of these systems in the Middle East, uh, not, not here, but in the Middle East, yet they were able to take, uh, detect uh, organics of, of drugs. Uh, you actually could drive the trucks through, and I believe it was 10 to 20 seconds, they could fully check a truck, and if they saw anything negative, then you pull them over to secondary inspection. So again, a lot of tools in the toolbox, a lot of technology, yet the meat and potato stuff still needs to be addressed. And that's where I think these matrix of measuring what is most cost effective from the perspective of the taxpayers and public safety is important. And like the chairperson was saying right now, now you're talking about direct shipments from China, you know, directly through the mail. There's another challenge, and I, I wouldn't know how to even begin to address that one, but again, these are all the challenges we have to look at, and where do we begin to invest, and I think we've got to come back to the matrix. Open statement, anybody care to address it? Um, Ranking member, I would add, I, from our perspective and what our work has shown, I mean, I think there's two, you know, kind of key steps that are part of this process is one, they, that we need to see the department and CBP just, just set the metrics. We've been recommending um, metrics in the border security area for several years. And so they actually need to make decisions on what they want to measure and, and set what those metrics are. And then the second step in that is that CBP collects a lot of data as an agency. And uh, certainly what um, Chief Luck was describing in terms of them now requiring asset assist information, for example, to be entered into their database, that's a really positive step. Uh, but what they need to do now is use that use the data they have systematically to uh, measure relative to the metrics and goals that they set. So those are really two um, you know, key fund fundamental steps that we think are an important part of this and, and assessing what we're getting out of the investments. Any other comments from the others? Thank you. Madam Chair, I yield. Well, I appreciate the gentleman yields back. Uh, we were just talking up here. I think there is some of the themes here are, are worth as we're looking towards a border security bill to consider working together on some of the integrating technology and increasing situational awareness and the port of entry technology. Uh, those are some of our do outs that uh, we're going to follow up on as we look to future legislation. I want to thank the witnesses uh, for your valuable testimony. I thought it was a good discussion. And members for the questions. Uh, the members of the committee may have some additional questions for the witnesses. I think you also have some that you took for the record as well. I uh, would ask you to respond to these in writing. Uh, pursuant to committee rule 7E, the hearing record will be open for 10 days. Without objection, the committee now stands adjourned.